Okay, our, our last talk of the morning will be by uh, Nima Nari, and he will uh, tell us all about many uses of stable polynomials. Hi, everyone. Uh, so this is based on joint works with Shayana Weisleran, Ali Reza Rezaei, Amin Saveri, and Mohit Singh. Uh, I must admit that I, I sort of did a bait and switch a little bit. <laughs> I'm not going to be able to cover everything that was in the abstract, but I tried to make the talk a gentle introduction to basically all of the ideas behind these connections that have been found uh, between stable polynomials and counting and optimization problems. Okay. So uh, let me start by uh, this example. So let's say that uh, I want to count spanning trees in a graph. Does anybody know how many spanning trees this graph has? 16. Perfect. Yes, here are all of them. Um, OK, so let's say I pick an edge E, and I count the number of spanning trees that uh, contain this edge E. Now what's the number? Eight. Eight. Perfect. I've highlighted them. I don't know if you can see them. I was guessing. Why, why is it? <laughs> <laughs> So, so you know, uh, this the fraction of the spanning trees that contain the edge E uh, is you can you can interpret it probabilistically as if you are picking a random spanning tree, you are trying to see what's the probability that your edge E is in the spanning tree. This is known in many communities by many names. You know, if you're thinking about the random uh, spanning tree distribution, this would be the marginal probability of edge E. It's sometimes known by the leverage score, or you know, if your graph is uh, unweighted. This is also equal to the effective resistance between the two endpoints of the edge E. Don't worry about, if, don't worry about it if you don't know what that means. Uh, but this connection uh, lets you compute these quantities in polynomial time. Okay. So, all right, so these marginals of the edges, I want to use them as features encoding my graph. So I want to uh, compute the marginals of the edges and I want to throw away my graph, and I want to see what I can tell about the graph based on these marginals. Okay. So for example, for this graph, uh, I translate it to a set of six uh, numbers, all of them equal to 1 half. Okay. So this would be like how for each edge you do this? Yes, for each edge in my graph, I do this. And I'm dealing with unweighted graphs. Okay. So all right. Uh, so, so this graph, for this graph, you know what the marginals are. Uh, but let's say there is an unknown graph whose marginals I tell you are exactly four ones. It's a tree. Yes. But first, st let's start with something simpler. <laughs> What's the number of edges? Obviously, it's four, the number of elements in my set. What's the number of vertices? It's five. Uh, basically, if you sum up all of these marginals, you're going to get the number of edges in a spanning tree, which is just the number of vertices is minus 1. Right? So if I add 1 plus the total sum, I get the number of vertices. So how many spanning trees does this graph have? You should be able to answer this. <laughs> 1. Right. Yes. But do I know the complete graph based on these? No. Could be any spanning tree with, uh, could be any tree with 4 vertices. Now let's do a more complicated example. What if the marginals were these quantities? Okay. Can you tell me what the number of spanning trees is? 16. 16 is a possible answer, yes. But that's not the only answer. Okay, so 16 you get by adding two dangling edges to the original graph that I started with. Uh, there is another graph which has exactly the same marginals. Uh, you have parallel edges. The parallel edges have effective resistance 1 half, and these two edges have effective resistance 1. Okay. Uh, so in this graph, the number of spanning trees is 8. Okay. So obviously, I can't determine exactly what the number of spanning trees is based on these marginals. Okay. But let's say that I want to find bounds on these things. Okay. So here is, here, is, here is a very crude upper bound that you can get based, uh, based on the marginals. Uh, it's based on the entropy method. Um, so let's say that T is a uniformly random spanning tree. Okay. What we want is the number of values it can take. Right? Uh, you can clearly uh, write the log of that number as the entropy of this random variable. Uh, is, is, is the definition of entropy, uh, who, knows, who, who doesn't know what the entropy is? Okay. Good. 
So, so if you have a discrete random variable, the Shannon entropy of it is defined as by this formula. I've, I've written it down for the spanning trees here. Sorry. Uh, I've written it down for the spanning trees here. Uh, and if your variable, uh, if your random variable takes n distinct values uniformly at random, the entropy of it is going to be log n. And so isn't that you have h of t shouldn't be this, uh, the calligraph t? Because uh, it's not a one specific tree, right? Uh, well, uh, sure. This is a random variable, though. I mean, you can write the entropy of a random variable. OK, OK. Calligraphy t is the set of all spanning trees. Okay, so we know that entropy is subadditive. Okay, meaning that if you have a bunch of random variables, the entropy of the joint random variable is less than the sum of the entropies. Uh, so if I look at whether each edge e was in my spanning tree or not, those would be variables uh, whose joint uh, distribution is the same as the distribution of t, and it clearly has the same entropy. Uh, so the entropy of the spanning, random spanning tree is less than the sum of the entropies of the edges. Okay? For each edge, I can compute these entropies because I know what the probability of that edge appearing in the random spanning tree is. Okay? Now, what's surprising is that for spanning trees, this, this inequality that I showed you is tight up to a factor of two. So, so for, for a second, let's believe that and see what it gives for uh, these marginals that we were working with. Uh, so, you know, uh, I have six edges. Each of them have one bit of entropy. So the total entropy uh, I get here is six. So it's telling me that the number, the entropy of my spanning tree uh, is between three and six, which means that the number of spanning trees is between eight and 64. We already saw an example with eight spanning trees. So at least uh, this inequality is tight in that case. Okay. Any <coughs> questions before I move on? So I want to I wanna show you a proof of this fact. Okay? It's, it's basically the only proof I have time to, to do completely. Uh, okay. So you know, we want to show that the entropy is bigger than half the entropy of the sum, ha half the sum of the entropies, sorry. Uh, I've written the sum of the entropy of each of these random variables. It's a Boolean random variable, so its entropy is just p log 1 over p plus 1 minus p log 1 over, uh, log one, over 1 minus p. Now, uh, if I want to show that twice the entropy is bigger than the sum, I can clearly, it's clearly enough to show that the entropy is bigger than this sum, and it's also bigger than this sum. Okay? So I'm going to show the first one. So here is where things get tricky. Uh, we are going to use polynomials. And uh, for spanning trees, there is, a, uh, there is a very useful polynomial called the generating polynomial. Uh, so think of this as a polynomial where for each edge of the spanning tree, you have one variable. For each spanning tree, you have a monomial, which is the product of the variables associated to the edges. And then you sum this over all spanning trees in your graph. Uh, is the definition clear? Okay. All right. Now, the only thing I'm going to use in this proof is that this polynomial is log concave over the positive numbers. Okay, so log it's log. Means what? It's log is concave. As a function, its log is concave. Okay. So, you know, if you have a concave function, uh, what's the best way of deriving inequalities based on it? It's by using Jensen's inequality, and that's what I'm going to do. So uh, let's define a random variable y, which is just some scaling of the indicator vector of my spanning tree. Okay? So my spanning tree has some uh, indicator vector. I'm going to rescale it so that its expectation becomes the all ones vector. So I'm going, to define, I'm going to divide each coordinate by its expectation, the probability of that edge appearing in the tree. Now this y variable, its expectation is the all ones variable. Now if I apply Jensen's inequality on it, uh, I get this. So Jensen just says that you can move the expectation outside and you get a smaller uh, quantity. Okay. So let's compute these two sides. Um, 
I, I made the variable y uh, have the expectation all ones, right? So the left-hand side is just the log of my polynomial evaluated at the all ones vector, which is clearly the number of spanning trees. Okay. So on the, on the left-hand side, I get the log of the number of spanning trees. What do I get on the right-hand side? Uh, I claim that I get exactly uh, this, this first sum end. Okay. Uh, let me actually write it down because I have space here. So what's a log of g of <coughs> y? It's going to be, so my y vector is going to uh, be some scaled version of the, uh, uh, the indicator vector of a spanning tree, right? So only one of these terms is going to survive, right? Only the term corresponding to that spanning tree is going to survive. And this is going to be uh, the sum over all edges in T of my scalings, log of my scaling. There's only one monomial surviving. I'm taking the log so I can, the monomial becomes the sum, right? And I get the log of one over whatever, whatever my scaling was, which was one over P, okay? Now, I'm taking the expectation of this over y. So now I have to, for each edge e, look at how many times it appears, or in, with what probability it appears in the sum. And that's exactly the probability that the edge e appears in my spanning tree. So this expectation is going to be the sum over all edges of PE log 1 over PE. And that's the end of the proof, uh, at least for proving that the entropy is at least this sum. Okay. Now, what do I do with the other part? Well, for the other part, you have to look at the complement of spanning trees. Okay. Uh, now you're dealing with some strange uh, objects, but they still satisfy all of these properties. If you can define a generating polynomial for them, which can, which can even be derived from the generating polynomial of spanning trees, and the generating polynomial is still going to be lock on cave, and you can uh, prove the same things. Except when you're looking at the complement, you're switching p with 1 minus p. Okay. But the complement has the same entropy as the, the, uh, as the tree, right? So I get the other side of the inequality. The only thing I haven't shown you in this proof was why was that uh, generating polynomial lock on cave? And that, that takes us to real stability. Okay. So, uh, you know, in the, in the previous talk, you, in the previous talks of uh, today, you, uh, you saw some definitions of real stability and hyperbolicity. Uh, I'm going to just uh, remind you uh, a polynomial, a multivariate polynomial is just real stable if if you restrict it to any univariate direction, uh, which has positive components, which is positive a slope, basically, uh, then uh, it must be real rooted. Okay? So any univariate uh, restriction of your polynomial uh, is real rooted if and only if the polynomial is real stable. That's the definition of real stability. Uh, another way of saying this thing is uh, your polynomial is hyperbolic with respect to every positive direction. Uh, now, in the previous talk, you, you saw that the polynomial, uh, a hyperbolic polynomial, sorry? Yeah. Uh, so could the last statement be true for subsets? Uh, which last statement? This factor to factor half? Yes, it is true. For subsets also? Yes. Because a subset of, a, uh, a subset of these distributions is also uh, satisfies uh, uh, last conditions, yeah. Okay. So uh, the generating polynomial, uh, uh, its hyperbolicity cone contains the positive orthend, right? It has non-negative coefficients. It's never zero on here. And in the in the previous talk, you saw that the uh, uh, the polynomial log of it is a concave barrier uh, for the hyperbolicity cone. 
uh, which means that the log of g is concave all over this place, uh, which includes the positive orthant as well. Any questions on that? Uh, so that was first shown by guarding. Uh, yeah. So I, I, I proved this to you for uh, spanning trees and their complements. But what is a more general statement? The more general statement uh, can only be said after I define strong Riley measures for you. So you know, uh, a spanning distri tree distribution is roughly a, a, a distribution uh, on a subset of the hypercube. Okay? Uh, you're just looking at whether the edges are in the spanning tree or not. Uh, in general, if you have a, a random variable taking values in the hypercube, or equivalently a distribution on the hypercube, uh, you can again assign a generating polynomial to this distribution. Uh, the coefficients are going to be the probabilities. And uh, for each possible value the random variable is taking, you have a monomial, okay? whose, whose powers are exactly the zero ones. Okay? So this is the generating polynomial, same as before. Uh, a strong ID measure is exactly a measure whose polynomial is real stable. That's the definition. Okay. And the key thing is that spanning tree distributions have this property. Uh, uh, here are the famous examples of such distributions. If you have independent Bernoullis, so if you're taking a, an independent distribution on the hypercube, uh, you are going to be uh, getting a real stable polynomial. Uh, more generally, if you have a determinantal distribution, so think of this as uh, you have some vectors in some high dimensional space, and you're taking uh, each subset of the vectors with probability proportional to the volume spanned by them squared. Okay. Um, so probability of subset of vectors is proportional to n squared of uh, vi's ins. Okay. So this is a determinantal distribution. Uh, determinantal distributions are slightly more general than this, but this case uh, contains most of their uses. Uh, spanning tree distributions are actually a special case of this, uh, where you take your vectors to be, uh, uh, where you take your vectors to be the uh, 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 the plus one minus one vectors uh, from which you construct the Laplacians of the graphs, for example. Uh, yeah, let me not uh, dive into that. Okay. So these are all examples of strong Riley distributions for which uh, our inequality holds. Okay. So uh, the inequality, uh, instead of counting, now you have to deal with the entropy of the uh, whole strong Riley distribution. Uh, you can approximate the entropy of the strong Riley distribution within a factor of two by the sum of the entropies. That's what it says. You can also uh, get an additive error approximation. And uh, let me explain that by writing another inequality here. So we saw two inequalities. One was that this is true, and the other one was that uh, <coughs> this is true. Now, uh, the thing is that if you have a distribution supported on uh, 0, 1 vectors whose L1 norm is some, some number n, this is at most n. Uh, or I can, I can even, uh, yeah, let me write it more clearly. So this thing over here is at most the sum of the PIs. Okay. It's, a, it's a trivial inequality to show. Uh, so, so the gap between the entropy of uh, my joint variable and the sum of the entropies is bounded by this quantity which is at most the sum of the PIs, right? 
So for spanning trees, the sum of the PIs is always n minus 1. So, my, so, so this thing is also giving me an additive approximation to the entropy, and the additive error is uh, at most n. Sometimes the additive approximation is better. Sometimes the multiplicative approximation is better. Yeah, it totally depends on your taste. Um, yeah. Is it always the case that if x is strongly rallied, then sort of its complement is also in the way? Yes. Yeah. Complement is always. Uh, you, you can basically derive the complement by inverting the variables and then multiplying the polynomial by something. Okay. Um, so just purely algebraic operations that pre preserve the condition and the roots. So back to counting, um, you know, I've shown you that <clears throat> if you give me the marginals from the uniform distribution on, on, <clears throat> on a strongly Riley set, then I can count the set uh, approximately. Okay? But usually, computing these marginals is as hard as uh, counting the counting problem that you're dealing with uh, in the beginning. Right? Uh, so how do I? How do I avoid this problem of computing these marginals and still get an approximation to, uh, to my counting problem? Uh, the solution is to max, just maximize over all feasible marginals. Okay? Uh, so let me, let me briefly explain this. So I know that my marginals uh, must satisfy some inequalities. In particular, they must be in the convex hull of my, <coughs> the indicator vectors of my set. Okay? Because any distribution on my set has marginals in this convex hull. That's the definition of the convex hull. And <clears throat> um, I know that this, these marginals coming from the uniform distribution are you know, some point in this convex hull. Okay? But I don't know which point it is. I just take the maximum sum of marginals for any feasible uh, point here. And I claim that it's still going to give you the same approximation. Okay. So uh, factor two or additive error uh, p, depending on your taste. OK? Um, yeah? A point of confusion for me. So the strongly rally manager requires that you have a distribution which induces the marginals. But now we're changing the base distribution, which is changing. So I'm, I'm here assuming that the base distribution is uniform. The base distribution, who, which gives you a real stable polynomial, is uniform. Okay. Okay. Um, that's why I said strongly Riley set, not the strongly Riley distribution, but anyways. Um, so I'm assuming the, yeah, the uniform distribution is the strongly Riley measure, uh, but I don't have access to, to the polynomial itself or, uh, yeah. Um, um, yeah. So, if I want to solve this maximization problem, the only thing I need to have is a separation oracle for this polytope. Okay? If you're dealing with, let's say, some weird matroid, you might have access to this, but not the polynomial defining the, the, the generating polynomial of the matroid. Okay? So that's why this, uh, this thing is uh, sometimes feasible while you don't have access to the counting problem. Now, let me just prove that this gives you the same approximation factor. Okay. The definition of feasible marginal here is literally just that it's in this set, but it's, it's not implied, I think, that any set of marginals actually induces some distribution over spanning trees. So any marginals in this set gives you some distribution in the spanning trees. That's true, because any point here can be written as a convex combination of the vertices. Oh, and the vertices are spanning trees. OK, obvious. Yeah. Okay, yeah. 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 That is true. Uh, but what's not clear is that you can, you can actually write any point here as a as the marginals of a strong reality distribution okay. supported on these okay. vertices. There might be some weird distribution on spanning trees. Yeah, there might be some weird distribution. Um, so, so far, the only one we know is rally is the uniform one. Yes. Yeah. And you're saying if we knew the marginals for the uniform distribution, we would sort of be done? But yeah, if the, if the marginals were, yeah, yeah. But even if you don't know them, by, by solving this maximization problem, you get the same approximation guarantee. Well, provided you get something that's strongly Rayleigh, right? Uh, what do you mean? Provided this B that you get corresponds to a strongly Rayleigh. Right? So that's what I'm going to actually prove, <laughs> that this P is always a. 
For maximizing the key is always strongly related. Yes. Okay. So, so you know, so let's let's start with a very complex uh, convex program. <clears throat> Let's say that I maximizing over all distributions uh, supported on my set T okay. of the entropy of this distribution. Okay. So, so the uniform distribution plays is not playing a special role here, it's just for simplicity. You can do the same thing. So so uh, if you if you have uh, if you if you have another distribution, then uh, somehow that doesn't correspond to the polytope anymore. Um, the polytope doesn't capture anything about the weights of my distribution, right? But you could change oh, the entropy by relative entropy, right? Uh, so you can change this entropy by the relative entropy if you if you allow your uh, distribution to be proportional to the product of weights of the elements. But I could have some crazy distribution that's not like that. Uh, So yeah, back here. Uh, so let's say I, I maximize over the over all distributions supported on my set of the entropy of that distribution. Uh, does anybody know what the answer to this is? Lots. Yes, the uniform distribution always has the maximum entropy, and it's going to be uh, the log of the size of my set, right? Now I can write this maximum uh, entropy program as, you know, I. I Break it down into two parts. First, I uh, fix the marginals of this distribution. And then I maximize over all distributions whose marginals are p. Any distribution must have some marginals. I just, you know, uh, uh, broke down this maximization into two parts. Now, the thing that's, that I'm not going to prove but is true is that if you fix some marginals, uh, the maximum ent entropy distribution that has those marginals is going to be given by uh, something like this. The probability of each spanning tree t is going to be proportional to the product of some lambda e's where E is in the tree. So you can always find some lambdas associated to the edges, uh, such that the probability of each spanning tree is just uh, proportional to this product. Okay? Uh, this is roughly true because the constraints you're putting uh, are fixing the marginals. And these lambdas are somehow dual to the constraints you're putting on this convex program. Now, if I knew that my uniform distribution was stronger Riley, this distribution is also stronger Riley. Because what's the generating polynomial of this distribution? The scaling. Yeah. You're just scaling each variable of your initial polynomial by just some lambda. Okay. So, so the thing that I get here is going to be stronger Riley. Uh, therefore, its entropy is going to be well approximated by the entropy I get from just the marginals, the sum of the entropies of the marginals. Therefore, this gives me the same approximation. Okay. Sorry. So in your program, you're, you're not maximizing the entropy subject to the marginal condition, are you? I mean, uh, I'm, I'm, just, I'm just making sure that my marginals is in the convex hull. In the convex hull. And this becomes a deterministic function of the marginals, which is. Right, but that's different from what's written over there. Right? Yes. Uh, yes. Uh, the optimal solution of this is not. I mean, uh, once you fix the marginals, you can always find a stronger Riley distribution that satisfies those marginals, as long as you have access to the polynomial. But <laughs> this program doesn't give you that strong Riley distribution. Um, okay. So first, you find the marginals with that, and then you do this. You don't have to, I mean, you don't have to do it, yeah. Do it. yeah. Do it. yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, if, if you want, you can do it, but. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, so what's the relevance of this thing? Uh, so you know, um, if you have access to, to, uh, to a separation oracle for your polytope, and your polytope is coming from a, a uniform uh, strong Riley distribution, 
then it's, it's sort of known that uh, you can actually get a 1 plus epsilon approximation to this uh, quantity that we were trying to count uh, as long as you allow randomization. Okay, so this is a result of Feather and Mihai. Okay. Uh, you know, it, this result has been extended to non-uniform strong reality measures as well. So you, you can even get the, the correct uh, uh, count when, when things aren't uniform and things aren't described by a polytope anymore. Uh, but this program is deterministic. It doesn't use randomization, and it gives you either a square root or you know, a 2 to the rank of your uh, polytope approximation. Okay. And just last week, I, I learned that there is some evidence that this cannot be improved if you, if you only you allow determinism. Okay. So this, this evidence is not a proof. Uh, uh, basically, so, so uh, this work of Azar, Broder, and Fries, uh, what they show is that if you want to count the number of uh, bases in a matroid, uh, and you only use uh, uh, independence oracles for that matroid, which are equivalent to basically the separation oracle for the matroid, uh, as long as you don't allow determinism, uh, as long as you don't allow randomization, uh, you can't get better than this approximation factor. Okay. Uh, this, is, this doesn't close the gap because uh, this convex program, we haven't proved that it works for any matroid. We have proved it, uh, that it works for certain matroids coming from strong delay distributions. But here is the open question. So, so you know, uh, the only thing you need to solve this convex program is a separation oracle for the convex hull. Uh, for certain matroids, you might have it. For certain other polytopes, you might have it. And you can always uh, uh, ask the question of how well does this approximate the quantity I'm trying to uh, count, the log of uh, uh, the number of elements in my set. Okay. So what I just showed you was that if this uh, set was basic, if the uniform distribution on this set was a strongly related distribution, then you have pretty good approximations. But you can ask this for, for other things. For example, if your, uh, if your set is the set of perfect matchings in a bipartite graph, okay? Uh, does this, what, approx what sort of approximation does this give, okay? It's sort of not hard to see that this still gives you a very good approximation, even for bipartite matchings. Okay? Um, the reason is roughly that, you know, I, I told you that this part is very unimportant. Okay? This part is always bounded by O of n, the 1 minus p uh, log of 1 over 1 minus p part. Okay? So if you throw this away from your maximization problem and instead you just maximize over this part, then what you get is the matrix scaling uh, algorithm, uh, first discovered by uh, Wittgerson, Upfall, and somebody else. Uh, yeah. um, okay. So, so that relates to uh, to basically the Van der Waarden conjecture. Um, what I'm going to show you uh, next is that. Uh, this thing still gives you an additive of an approximation if your set T is the intersection of two uh, nice sets. If your set is the intersection of two, uh, two sets whose uniform distribution is strong in IV. Okay? Uh, so this sort of generalizes the, the, uh, the one above. I'm going to show you next how you can write the bipartite matchings as intersections of two of these things. Right, because the entropy could be smaller than n. So n here is, okay, yeah, uh, good question because I have to clarify here. So here I'm, 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 my, uh, my set is uh, on 0, 1 to the m. Uh, n is basically the maximum number of ones that, I, that can appear in this set. Okay, but there could only be like one perfect match. Sure. And yes. The entropy is 0, which is saying it's minus n. The entropy is zero, but I'm saying that it's uh, an additive approximation. Can sure. you get like one sided additive approximation or uh, what do you mean by one sided? Uh, like if there's no perfect matching. 
So if there is no perfect matching, the entropy is negative infinity. Right. Uh, OK, but it is one perfect matching. Right. I can't, I can't distinguish between 2 to the n perfect matchings and one perfect matching. Yes. Okay. And that's the best we know for, uh, uh, for deterministic algorithms, actually. So I'm not breaking any of those. Uh, OK, so a very nice open question here is, if you're, if you're dealing with general graphs, not bipartite graphs, you can still write the same program. And you can hope that this gives you still an additive of an approximation to the number of perfect matchings. Okay. I should mention that this is probably a very hard problem. <laughs> because uh, if you, if you uh, resolve this in the positive, then you would have solved uh, the lovash plummer conjecture, which has been open for quite a while. Uh, what, what is the? So the lovash plummer conjecture is, uh, there, are, there are different versions of it. But uh, the version I like the best is that if you have a graph which is k regular, so every node uh, has degree k, and it's also k connected. So any way you, uh, you cut it, you, you get at least k edges. Um, then the number of perfect matchings in this graph is going to be at least some function of k to the n, where this f of k goes to infinity as k goes to infinity. So roughly, roughly the reason that uh, this implies the lovash plummer conjecture is that uh, if you have such a graph, then the vector of all 1 over k's is in the matching polytope. If you, if you put a 1 over k over all of the edges, you get a point in the matching polytope. And uh, you know, for that point, this entropy is going to give you uh, omega of k to the n. But still, I don't know of any counterexamples to this. So this is a generalization of the lovash plummer conjecture. Uh, probably quite hard to resolve. OK, but I think it's true for k equals 3. Yes, it's been solved for k equals 3. Yes. Just remind me. Yeah. Uh, so let me, let me give you an overview of what I've just said. Um, so there is always this picture that I like to uh, bring up, which is that these strongly Riley measures are discrete counterparts to uh, these nice continuous distributions that we, uh, that we love. Uh, and those are the lock concave distributions. Okay. Uh, why do I want to bring up this picture? It's because there are a lot of similarities between the two. Okay. So from lock concave uh, functions, you can do efficient sampling. Uh, from strong Riley measures, you can also do efficient sampling. That's the Markov chain algorithm, which is a generalization of the federer mihai result that I talked about. You can also do uh, maximization approximately in these things. So for log concave functions, maximization or finding the mode is equivalent to solving a, convic uh, a concave program. Uh, for strong Riley measures, uh, Mohit talked a bit, a, a little bit about the, some particular version of it, where the strong Riley measure is a determinantal distribution. Uh, but uh, basically, the same result holds when, whenever, <clears throat> whenever you have any uh, strong Riley measure with access to its generating polynomial. Um, so that's the result of uh, Sasho. So you know, you you have these distributions. Uh, you can do. Uh, sort of uh, efficient algorithmic things with them. Uh, but how can you build uh, more and more of such distributions? Uh, well, in the lock concave case, there are a lot of operations that preserve lock concavity. In the strong Riley case, there are also a lot of operations that preserve uh, being strong Riley. Okay? So here are some of them. So if you, if you do an affine transformation of a lock concave function, you still get a lock concave function. Uh, if you do symmetrization, so you, uh, in the strong Riley case, you, you basically collapse two variables into one. Uh, you still get a, a strong Riley distribution. You can do conditioning. Uh, so you condition on one variable having a certain value. In either case, you're still going to get the, uh, a distribution in the same class. Uh, you can do marginization. So you sum over all values in one direction. Okay. So, so if, you're, if you think of 
random variables associated to these distributions. Marginalization is like uh, just dropping one of the variables. So this relates to the subset question you asked. Um, <clears throat> so if you do marginalization, you still get, uh, you're still going to get this, uh, a strong UID distribution. Uh, convolution of these things is still going to give you uh, uh, a distribution in the same class. Um, <coughs> For strong Riley measures, uh, it's sort of easy to see why convolution gives you a strong Riley distribution. It's because convolution corresponds to multiplying the generating polynomials. Uh, so if generating polynomials uh, have roots in certain regions or don't have roots in certain regions, that's preserved by taking the product. There is one operation which is sort of different between the two, and that's taking pointwise products. Um, so log concave distributions, if you take a pointwise product, you're going to get the sum in the log. Uh, sum of concave functions is concave. But for strong UID measures, that's no longer true. Uh, so product of strong UID measures is not necessarily strong UID anymore. Uh, but we can still do basically the two algorithmic operations that we wanted approximately on the product. Okay. So that's what we proved. If you have two strong UID distributions, mu and nu, uh, you can compute the <clears throat> you can compute the an approximation to the sum of the products, or you can compute an approximation to the maximum of the products, uh, whichever you want. So that's counting. That's optimization. Uh, uh, the quality of the approximation is still going to be like before exponential in uh, basically the degree of the polynomials, or the maximum uh, number of ones appearing in the support of the distributions. Um, okay. uh, let's see what that means in terms of some concrete problems, so bipartite matching. Uh, so if you have a bipartite graph and you want to count the number of perfect matchings in it, uh, you can write it as, as a sum of uh, products of two strong UID measures. So uh, the mu distribution is going to do the following. It's going to, for each uh, vertex on the bottom side of the graph, it's going to pick uh, one of its adjacent edges uniformly at random. Okay. The new distribution is going to do the same thing for the top side. Okay. So, so now the new distribution only allows uh, one edge adjacent to each vertex on the top side. Mu satisfies that for the bottom side. If you take the product, you're going to get the number of perfect matchings, because the only terms that survive in this product are sets of edges that have exact, that are uh, adjacent to, uh, that, that basically satisfy the degree constraints, that their degree on the bottom side and on the top side are exactly one for each vertex. Uh, so that's one example of a problem that you can solve using this. Uh, another example, which I won't go into, uh, is the so-called Nash social welfare. It's some, uh, some problem that, uh, uh, <clears throat> that economists are interested in. And uh, the discrete version of it is quite hard to, uh, to solve. And based on these, uh, uh, based on these uh, sums, you can sort of get a, an approximation algorithm for it. Okay. Uh, now, uh, I told you that you can get approximations to the sum and the max. I didn't tell you how you get them. Okay? And I didn't tell you why the basic problem that I told you, the maximization of the entropy and the intersection of the, So this maximization problem of these things p in the convex hull of two of these sets. I didn't tell you why this maximization still gives you an additive of an approximation. Okay. So to show you this, I have to tell you what our uh, inequality says. So again, as before, uh, we are going to fix some marginal vector. 
this marginal vector is now going to be both in both of these two convex hulls. Uh, so it's going to be realizable for, for both of my strong reality measures. And now I take the maximum relative entropy with respect to these distributions. So uh, if you don't want to think about relative entropy, think of these as sets. And I, I take the entropy itself. Okay. So the entropy. Uh, given by uh, the maximum entropy I can get with those marginals on, on sets T1 and T2. Okay. So these two things are the entropies I can realize with the marginals P. And the inequality that we show is some sort of an entropic inequality. It says that the entropy of the distribution I get, I get on mu plus the entropy of the distribution I get on nu minus the sum of the entropies I get on the individual variables, this is a lower bound for the quantity that you want, log of the sum of the products. Okay. So, so before, before going further, let's see why this implies that this gives you an additive O of an approximation. So you know, I, I, I take this maximum, and I want to prove so, so certainly the maximum is above uh, the quantity that I want, because the entropy always upper bounds uh, the cardinality. Right. So this thing is always uh, bigger than the sum of the, uh, the sum of the uh, kappa. So the upper bound side is, is true just because of the subadditivity of the entropy. I just have to show you that the lower bound side holds, that this thing is uh, uh, smaller than uh, what I want, plus some additive O of n. Okay. Now, for the mu distribution, I have, I have uh, two inequalities describing what this is. Right? Uh, I know that this thing is bigger than the sum of pi log 1 over pi and is at most the sum of pi log 1 over pi plus this thing. Right? Just based on the fact that p is in the uh, convex hull given by mu distribution. Okay. Uh, for the new distribution, I still get the same thing. Okay. Now, let's see. So I just write that this thing is bigger than the sum of pi log 1 over pi. Okay. Now, if I add it to the same quantity for nu and subtract uh, uh, the entropies of the marginals, uh, what do I get? Well. The entropies of the marginals have two terms. One of them is going to cancel with what I was lower bounding this by. Right? So what I end up with is marginals on nu minus the sum of 1 minus pi log 1 over 1 minus pi. Right? So this thing is O of n, as I said before, right? And this thing is within O of n of this thing. Okay. So, so that sum of the entropies of pi's is in total is within O of n of the lower bound I've proved on, on this quantity. So, so in other words, I, I've just shown you that for any pi's that are in both the convex hulls, uh, this quantity is within O of n of, is, is lower bounding this quantity within O of n. Uh, the upper bound part was just a consequence of the subadditivity of the entropy, so I've, I've proved both sides of the inequality. Any questions on that? Right. 
So what we also show is that uh, this thing is within O of D, or sorry, this should be N, O of N of the right-hand side. Basically, if from the entropies you drop the 1 minus P log 1 over 1 minus P terms, you get an upper bound of this thing. I'm going to give you some, some intuition of why that is. Um, but uh, for now. Um, so I, before going on, I should mention that uh, uh, you know, these, these relaxations, uh, the relaxation that I showed you, is uh, somehow built on some results of Gorvitz that first used real stable polynomials to use the van der Waarden conjecture. Uh, there are also some other relaxations by uh, Nishit Vishnoi and Damien Stratzak. Uh, they also get some approximations to exactly this quantity and the max quantity. Uh, their approximations uh, sometimes achieve similar results, sometimes they are linear in M, the number of variables, uh, as opposed to the degree. Um, so what I want to show you now is uh, 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 basically where this upper bound comes from. Okay? So this, this quantity. Uh, plus d uh, is going to be an upper bound of this. Uh, I'm going to show you how, uh, uh, how that upper bound is derived. So before actually uh, uh, deriving the entropy uh, uh, inequality that I mentioned in the previous slide, uh, we, we were dealing with a much simpler idea that resulted uh, in, in, in the inequality. Uh, this simpler idea is somehow dual to the previous inequality, somehow a dual to the convex program computing the previous inequality. Uh, but it's much simpler to describe, so I want to uh, start from scratch. So, so let's say that you want to compute this uh, sum of the products. Uh, this sum of the products looks like <clears throat> some polynomial that you already have. Okay? So the generating polynomial of the mu, let's say, already has the mu terms in it. The, the terms that, uh, the extra terms that it has are just monomials in the zi variables. Uh, we, we, we could hope that these were equal to the new variables. If we could find su a setting of the zi such that each monomial would be exactly new, uh, uh, the, new the corresponding new coefficient, then I could just evaluate my polynomial at the zi's and get exactly the sum of the products. Okay. Well, in general, that's, that's too much to ask for. So instead of an equality, I ask for an inequality. So for each monomial, I ask that the monomial is bigger than the new coefficient. Okay. Then clearly, if I find a setting of the z variables that satisfies this, uh, g mu evaluated at those z variables is going to give me an upper bound for my product, the sum of products. So you have, a, you have a clear way of getting upper bounds. Uh, what's, the tightest way, uh, what's the tightest upper bound that you can get? You can, you can write it in a, as a convex program. Okay? So what you want to do is you want to find the minimum of my polynomial over values z1 through zn, such that the monomials for each monomial kappa uh, are upper bounding the new variables, the new values. Uh, this convex program, uh, this program can be turned into a convex program if you just take the, uh, the log of the variables uh, and the log of the objective function. Okay. Uh, so it becomes a geometric program uh, for people who are familiar with this. But the, but the trouble is still that uh, I have potentially exponentially many inequalities here, one for each monomial. Uh, so I can't, I can't possibly hope that I can solve this. Uh, uh, but there is a way of relaxing this further to get a nicer convex program. So instead of, instead of having uh, this monomial inequality, I'm going to replace this, uh, this uh, new, uh, sorry, uh, uh, this new variable 
by, uh, by another quantity which is bigger than it, and then I'm going to uh, require my z variables to be bigger than this relaxed quantity. Okay. So what is this relaxed quantity? So now I'm dealing with the generating variable, the generating polynomial of the second distribution, the distribution nu. So any monomial that you get, uh, kappa, uh, I can compute uh, this ratio for it. This, this comes from works of Gorbitz. So let's say that all of the kappas are one, okay? Then in the numerator, I'm going to get uh, at least this monomial times nu of kappa. And when I divide it by the denominator, I'm going to get nu of kappa plus some other positive terms, right? So whatever I have in, in here is bigger than nu of kappa, okay? Uh, that was for kappa, which was equal to all ones. But even if you set some of the variables, for some of the kappas to zero, this thing is still going to be bigger than nu of kappa. Not very hard to see. And again, uh, you have an upper bound for nu of kappa. Uh, what you can do is you can find the best such upper bound. That's probably going to be a tight upper bound. Uh, and in fact, Gorvitz had already shown that this gives you an, uh, uh, an exponential approximation to a nu of kappa. So there is a, this is tight up to an exponential factor. So, so in some sense, we don't lose anything by replacing nu of kappa here with this thing. So now instead of, uh, instead of requiring that all monomials be bigger than nu, I require that all monomials be bigger than the relaxation of nu. Right? And I, I even require it for even fractional values of kappa now. Okay. Um, so it turns out that this, this whole uh, thing is a, uh, is a log concave value in kappas if you treat them as fractional values. And then you can, you can now solve or give a separation oracle for, for all of the inequalities of this form. Okay. So, so if, you, if you do the diligence and uh, write this out and take the appropriate tool, uh, you get this uh, max-min program. Okay. So the maximization is over all kappas. You should think of these as the marginals. Uh, the minimization is over all y and z variables, uh, which go into the polynomials, the generating polynomials, and I'm dividing by some appropriate monomial of the y and z's. Okay? How is this related to the entropy thing that I was telling you about? Well, forget about nu and forget about the z variables. If, if you fix kappas and you try to minimize the ratio between g, g mu and the appropriate monomial of yi's, uh, it's exactly going to give you the entropy, the relative entropy of the best distribution you can get uh, with marginals kappa i's. There is a way that you can, you can actually remove these kappa i's from the yi's, and you can move them uh, outside of the whole thing. And so for the second term, you're going to get the, un the relative entropy in the distribution nu. Uh, once you remove the kappa i's, uh, the thing that you're going to get here is going to be basically this term. Um, the sum of the entropies of the, uh, the marginals. Um, and this shows that uh, at least the upper bound holds. I won't have time to go uh, over the lower bound, unfortunately. Uh, so, so let me conclude here. Um, so what I just showed you was that, uh, you know, strong Rayleigh measures, they exhibit a, a lot of uh, similarities to lock concave distributions in the continuous world. You can maximize them, you can, approximately, you can approximately maximize them, you can approximately count them, you can efficiently sample from them, and so on. So one, one uh, very nice open question here is, uh, you know, this, this sum, we are currently getting an exponential approximation factor for it. Uh, is, there a, is there a Markov chain that you can run that gives you a 1 plus epsilon approximation to this? And this is partially motivated by the fact that when, when these mu and nu uh, give you the bipartite matchings, we have such a Markov chain due to Jerome, Sinclair, and Vygoda. Um, so can you, can you somehow generalize that? 
to work for uh, all such distributions. Uh, we have hardness results that show that you can't get better than exponential approximation to the max problem. But that's, uh, that's a hard thing. This, this simple uh, sum of the marginal entropies program, what polynomials can you prove? Uh, it, uh, can you show that it gives you a, a good approximation to the corresponding counting problem? Okay. Um, so uh, this relates back to the non-uniform distribution questions that you were asking. Uh, so so if, you have a, if you have a set of the vertices of the hypercube, uh, this convex program makes sense for, uh, for counting that set. Uh, but what if your set is weighted? What if you have crazy weights on the set? Is there somehow an analog of the polytope, maybe in some higher dimensional space, for which you can still write this convex program and get similar results? And then finally, I think, uh, so this is an instance of this more general problem. Can we, can we uh, prove that the entropy program for uh, general matchings uh, gives you a good approximation? And can we, in fact, use stable polynomials to prove it? Uh, thanks. Do we have time for one or two questions? So um, these constraints you had on the on this the product of the Z's uh, that okay, Z to the kappa should be at least E of kappa. Uh, you said the problem there is that they're exponentially many of these, but if new is somehow nice like yes. uh, yeah. generating polynomial of a regular metroid, you can have a separation or Yeah, good question, yes. So uh, let me go back here. <clears throat> so the question is, you know, uh, in general, this, these are exponentially many constraints, and you can't generally hope to have a, a separation oracle for it. Uh, but let's say news are 0, 1 variables. Okay, so, so they are basically the indicators of the basis of a matroid, let's say. Okay. Then you can, you can actually uh, get a separation oracle here. Okay. And you can potentially get a tighter uh, convex program. Yes, that's true. Uh, so I mean, our, because this was a relaxation of this, you definitely get a tighter value uh, if, you, if you just do this for matroids. But you don't know if you can change uh, I think I know that. Uh, sorry? Oh, it, right. Yeah, yeah. I don't. So, you started the counting basis of matroids. For these matroids, is it known to be hard? For spanning trees, I can count, right? Exactly. Sure, sure, sure. For spanning trees, you can always count. Uh, it's not known to be hard for uh, matroids that are, whose uniform distribution is strong, right? It's known to be hard for general matroids with deterministic algorithms. So you, your result is for counting, right? For counting the number of intersections. Just wanted to check if the intersection is empty or not. Is there an easy approach? Uh, so, it, so, good question. So that's just matroid intersection. <laughs> um, what I didn't tell you was that if you have multilinear polynomials, uh, then uh, their support is always a, the set of bases of a matroid, basically, okay. as long as they're homogeneous. But for general strongly rel, it's always the case that the intersection is an easy thing? Uh, the intersection thing is an easy thing uh, because of this convex program. <laughs> uh, I think if you have, not sure. So, so for, for general uh, uh, real stable polynomials, uh, the support is always a jump system. I think it's not true that the intersection of two jumps, two general jump systems, can be checked to be non-empty. Uh, but I think if you if you assume that your coefficients here are positive, you you get jump systems that are full, and then you can maybe do it. I mean, I'm not sure. I have to. Yeah. Just for clarity, you are only dealing with uh, distributions over zero one, right? Or like where where the polynomial. Right. So, yeah, that's a good question. So. Uh, if, so 
what I what I talked about was only for distributions over the hypercube, but you can you can have distributions over z to the n, right? Uh, for those, you have some corresponding uh, sum of the products and max of the products, uh, and you can still. So the reason I didn't talk about non-zero one values was that there are some some factorial. Uh, some weird uh, factors have to come into play, which are basically the factorials of the powers. Uh, so to keep it clean, I didn't go over there, but uh, still you get some similar results. Uh, when, yeah. is it, I mean, is it just that the, the, the powers of the, the I guess the z's become bigger integers? So, um, so the powers of the z's become, in, become bigger integers, but now the quantity you want to you wanna find is not just a uh, the sum of the mu kappa, nu kappa. It's also, uh, you have to multiply it by this weird thing, kappa 1 factorial of t kappa n factorial. Uh, this is called the Bombieri inner product between these two powers. Uh, yeah. I don't have to, time to go into the details of why these factorials appear, but yeah. Okay, uh, let's take remaining questions offline uh, and uh, uh, the afternoon session started at 2.30.